Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. My name is Nathan Ronan and I'm the uh, CFA lead instructor here at Chalk and Board for the CFA review courses for level one, level two, and level three. What I'd like to do in this little sample here of level one is I'd like to talk about a topic that arises in the level one program that many candidates struggle with. It's a combination of sampling and estimation and hypothesis testing, which is in the quant material. And I consider this material to be quite important for you to understand and master because you're going to need to utilize the concepts that you learn at level one in these two readings in level two when you do time series and when you do uh, simple linear regression and multiple linear regression. Okay. So that being the case, let's take a little sample here of how I teach so that you can understand why it's important to understand and apply rather than just memorize, which is what many times you do when you are given so many PowerPoints and bullet points, you end up just memorizing the data on there. And that's not the key to passing the level one exam or even level two or level three. It's really mastering the concepts, understanding the concepts, and then applying them to the kinds of questions you get on the level one exam. So if you take a look, to the left of me, you'll see a whole bunch of uh, information here and I will go through it as much as we can in our limited time so that you can understand it. But this is how I would do this in a classroom setting or on my on-demand videos. Okay. Let's say I'm a fundamental analyst at a firm and I've been recently disappointed with the performance of some of my stock picks. And I'm even getting phone calls from clients and they're saying, hey, listen, my portfolio is down. I, I, you know, your, your stock picks are not working. Well, I'm a little bit concerned about that. And then suddenly, I'm looking at some ads and I notice an ad from a technical stock selection service company. And in this ad, this technical stock selection service company makes a claim. They claim that on average, over the last year, on all of their hundreds and hundreds of stock picks, they've earned an average annual total return of 15%. Now that gets my eyes, my eyebrows raised because I believe that 15% in the current environment is pretty good and it's a lot better than I'm doing. And I'd like to somehow take a look at the information that this technical stock selection service company is using in order to earn their 15% rate of return and maybe incorporate that into my own analysis and improve my own returns. Now I do understand that Technical analysis and fundamental analysis are very different, but in this environment right now, we're looking to not lose money and we're also looking to retain our clients. So maybe there's some kind of value in what the technical analysts are doing or what this technical, uh, technical stock selection service company is doing that I could incorporate in my fundamental analysis. So I go over to my boss who is a manager and I say to him, look, I'd like to uh, subscribe to this technical stock selection service company's materials and incorporate it into our own stock picks wherever we can because they've been earning a 15% rate of return on their stock picks over the last year. Take a look at this. So my manager looks at it and he says, well, you know, Nathan, that's uh, really interesting and all that and I like it and I agree with you, 15% is a pretty good return. But you know what, before we just blindly subscribe to their services and spend money, why don't we take a little sample? Why don't we do some sampling? Why don't we take a sample of their stock picks and see whether we get 15% as well? Or do we get something very dramatically different? So my manager and I, we sit down one day and we select 16 stocks at random from all of the stock picks, the hundreds and hundreds of stock picks that the technical stock selection service company made over the past year and we get a different return. We don't get the 15% rate of return that they claimed. We actually got 11%. And the standard deviation associated with our sample return of 11% is 9%, okay? So what we would do is we would notate that the technical stock selection service company's claim of 15% is the total return on all their stock picks, so that's the entire universe. So therefore the population mean is 15%. We took a limited sample size of 16 stocks. So N is equal to 16, N is the number of observations. And from those 16 observations that we took at at random, we got a sample mean. Our, the mean of our sample of 16 stocks is 11%. 11%, as you can see, is not 15%. It's very different. 
but how different? That's the key point. And the standard deviation of that sample, of that limited sample size of 16 stocks that we did was 9%. So I'm a little bit disappointed. And I say to my boss, oh, well, listen, I'm really sorry for wasting your time. Obviously, 11% is not 15%, so I'm not even going to bother further. Let's just forget about it and forget I came in here and I'll just keep working at it to come up with better stock picks. My manager says, hey, Nathan, hold on a second. Hold on, come back, come back. See, this is why you're sitting in a cubicle and why I'm sitting in this corner off. No, he doesn't say that to me. But But he says to me, you know what, Nathan, look, let's understand something. We only took 16 stocks. How many stock picks did they have? hundreds and hundreds. Do you think if we selected another 16 stocks at random, we would still get a sample mean of 11%? I don't think so. Maybe we'd get 12%. Maybe we'd get 15%. Maybe we'd get 20%. Maybe we'd even get 2%. Remember, you're only taking 16 stocks from their entire hundreds and hundreds of stock picks. But we don't have the ability now or the time to select to select or look at every one of their stock picks. So realize that this, there might be some sampling error here, okay? So what we need to do is we need to actually find if the 11% that we got from our limited sample size of 16 stocks, if that sample mean of 11% is statistically significantly different from the technical stock selection service company's claim of 15%. And what we do is we set up our hypothesis test first, and we're going to do a two-tailed test. And we, we can distinguish a two-tailed test from a one-tailed test. A two-tailed test will have equal to or not equal to as the null and alternate hypothesis, whereas the one-tailed test will be with inequalities, with a greater than and equal to or less than or equal to. And therefore, whenever ever there's an inequality, it's a one-tailed test. If it's equal to or not equal to, then it's a two-tailed test. Now, we could do this as a one-tailed test or as a two-tailed test. Most likely on the exam, you're going to see everything done as a two-tailed test. Once in a while, they might ask a one-tailed test, but that's more done at level two. So let's focus for now in, this, in our limited time on the two-tailed test. So we're going to set up the null hypothesis, H sub zero, as the population mean is equal to 15%. And then we're going to set up the alternate hypothesis as the population mean is not equal to 15%. When we set it equal to or not equal to a specific integer just like this, this is a two-tailed test because the rejection area can be in two different areas, all the way to the right or all the way to the left of the acceptance area, as you can see from that diagram. And what we want to do is we always want to reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternate hypothesis. Remember, AA, accept the alternate. That's what we always want to do. Reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternate hypothesis. Why? Well, this is why you, what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to learn here, not just memorize. <coughs> you want to accept the null hypothesis. You want to accept the alternate hypothesis because you want to find a result that is statistically significantly different from what you expected. You want to find a result that is in the tails. You don't want to find a result that is in the acceptance area because it's too close to what you assumed anyway. So why do, if everything is going to be exactly what you assumed, why even do these tests? So we always want to find a result that is in the tails, in the rejection area. And there are three tests that are identified in the level one program, and you will see them again in level two, about whether to whether you're going to accept or reject the null hypothesis. Test number one is called the t-test based on the student t distribution. Test number two is called the confidence interval test. And test number three is called the p-value test. For the purposes of the level one exam, I would focus more on the t-test and on the confidence interval test You would want to know the p-value test, but don't overstudy that because that's more of a topic that comes up in the level two program when you're doing rejection, comparing the p-value with the level of significance. So I would focus more on these first two tests, test number one and test number two, the t-test and the uh, confidence interval test. Let's look at test number one, the t-test. Bottom line, bottom line, we need to compare a calculated t, also known as the computed t-value, with a critical t-value. And the conclusion is, for those that like to memorize, which I don't recommend, that is that if I look at the absolute values, everything on an absolute value basis, if the calculated T is less than or equal to the critical T, I will accept the null hypothesis. 
But if, I, if the calculated T, again, on an absolute value basis is greater than the critical T, then I will reject the null hypothesis. Now, if you take a look at the diagram to the right, you'll see the bell-shaped distribution, the normal distribution, and you'll see that we are going to have these critical T values on the left and on the right. And then you could see, well, if the calculated T is greater than the critical T on an absolute value basis, if the calculated T is greater than the critical T, I am in the rejection area. And on the other hand, if the calculated T is less than the critical T, I'm in that acceptance area. So that little diagram re-illustrates the conclusions that you have with those absolute value, you know, uh, demonstrations. So you really don't need to memorize this. You could just sort of remember the, you could sort of remember that normal distribution with the critical T and then the calculated T. And always remember that the rejection area is in the tails. Okay, so you don't really need to memorize those absolute values and how they go because you might forget that three weeks from now. Now, when we talk about a critical T value, what do we mean by a T value or a Z value when we're dealing with means? What we're talking about here with a T value or a Z value is how many standard deviations I am away from the mean. So when I get a T value of 2.02, .02, that means that I am 2.02 .02 standard deviations away from the mean. If I get a Z value of 1.96, that means I'm 1.96 standard deviations away from the mean. So that is what a T value or a Z value means. Now with the critical T value and the calculated T value, there's two ways that you can come up with both of them. And you need to know this for the exam. For the critical T value, there's two ways. You can use the rule of thumb, which is based on the confidence interval. So if they tell you that you're using a 95% confidence interval, you should know that you are approximately two standard deviations away from the mean. So the critical T would be two, as you can see. So 95% would be two. Uh, and then you would, they would, and if you could also use, if they tell you you're using a 99% confidence interval, then you would use three standard deviations away from the mean and use three as your critical T value. That's called the rule of thumb. And you would use that rule of thumb if they don't provide you with the student T tables. If they provide you with the student T tables next to the question, then you need to come up with the more precise, not an approximation, but a more precise number using N minus one degrees of freedom, which would be 16 minus one in this case, which is 15. 15 degrees of freedom, because we take the number of observations, which is 16 minus one, which is 15. And then we say, okay, there's 5% in the tails, because 95% is my confidence interval, so 5% is in my tails, 5% is the rejection area. And since there's 5% in the two tails together, that's two and a half in each. So I would look up 15 degrees of freedom with 5% in one tail or 2.5% two, or 2 in to in each of the tails. And if I do that, I would come up with 2.131. So those are my critical T values. And then I compare that to my calculated T. There's two ways that you can have the calculated T or the computed T as it's called. One is that they give it to you, which is unlikely, but sometimes they do and then it becomes easier. The other way is to remember this formula, which I would explain in further detail, which I'm showing you right now. To come up with the calculated T, you would take the sample mean, which is called the point estimate. You would subtract the hypothesized value, which is mu of x in this case, because that's my hypothesis test, my hypothesized value. That difference in the numerator is called the sampling error. And then we adjust that by the standard error of the sample means. And the standard error of the sample mean is not S of X, it's S of X bar. And, and if I do the math, standard, the standard error of the sample mean is the standard deviation that I got for my one sample of 9% divided by the square root of the number of observations. And if I do that, I get 1.78 or negative 1.78. But again, I'm not interested in apps. I'm, I'm interested only in absolute values. So when I compare 1.78 to 2 or 2.131, I see that I end up accepting the null hypothesis. What does that mean that I'm accepting the null hypothesis? That basically means that I cannot refute the technical stock selection service company's claim that they earned a 15% rate of return on their stock picks. Did I prove that they actually earned 15%? No, I did not. I can only say that I cannot refute their claim. Maybe if I took a larger sample size or more sample sizes of 16, I would come up with a different conclusion. But based on my one limited sample size, of 16 stocks, 11% is not statistically significantly different from 
15%. And that's how you would learn this material. And then we would move on to test number two and test number three.